Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by Sinusoid Pro Audio Couture. We talk a lot about different things that they do, but at the end of the day, what Sinusoid can do for you is provide a custom shop experience for your guitar instrument patch cable needs. Well, all your other cable needs too, Steve. Power, Not just patch cables. Speaker. Basically, what I'm saying is you go on their site and you hit up like their online chat or you send them an email and you just tell them like, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking. And then they say like, hey, maybe we can do that or maybe we, they can't. Here's what I'm going to say. If say you have a musical instrument and you need some way to connect that musical instrument to a device that will amplify the sound coming from that instrument. You need something that's going to give you a metallic connection and it's going to be flexible to your needs. Cables are going to do that for you. I don't know if you've heard of cables before, but they're the piece of technology that you're missing in your rig. Uh, Sinusoid makes the best cables and they make smiles. Go check out Sinusoid right now. <laughs> Sinusoidcables.com Hey, this is Ryan. And this is Steve, and you're listening to 60 Cycle Hum, the guitar buying, selling, trading, mining, fixing, breaking, reviewing, playing podcast. Just a little bit of fumble there, Steve. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Everyone mm -hmm. keeping score at home can, uh, you know, just notice that fumble. I don't. I wouldn't call that a ten. It's you know, it's a nine. It's really hard it's to. Get, it's really me. hard to get that five out of seven. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything new, Steve? Uh, I think this is a part of the episode where I ask you what's new. Oh, really? You want me to go first? Yeah. Okay. I went first last time. All first right. I'll go first. I did Steve. go first last time. Steve, I don't want to start a fight right now. All right. <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. You. All right. I'm. I'm ready to do it. I. Uh, I ordered a pedal this week. And I paid my own money for it. I didn't. You know, write someone and be like, "Hey, let me demo this thing. Let me, let me just send it to me." I paid my own real money for it, and I'm looking forward to receiving it in September. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's gonna, I didn't know what the timeline on this it's was. It's going to be a while. I mean, it's, you know, like a Kickstarter Indiegogo thing or whatever. Uh, so it said delivery date is September 2018. You know, there's obviously a big question mark there. Who knows with these things? Uh, but I ordered the, that uh, that plasma pedal from Game, Came, from Game Changer. Uh, I didn't even get to see this thing at NAMM. I missed it. I remember seeing their booth and apparently uh, they, I don't, apparently I either signed something or I don't know. Because yeah, you got been, us up on a mailing list somehow. Because we're somehow on their mailing list, um, which is interesting because I sign up for, like I'm registered with NAM right. under my own email address. So usually whenever we get 60 Cycle Hum emails, they're always directed to you. Yeah, that's why I looked at the email because like, hey Steve, I was like, is Steve running business right now? Is 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 Steve hustling behind the scenes? And I didn't know it. Yeah. So I opened it up and it was like, oh, just so you know, like the Kickstarter is going to start like tomorrow. And I like sat and thought about it. And then the next day they sent another email. I was like, I should probably get in on this. It's a really freaking cool looking pedal. It shoots lightning, and like it like the lightning flashes with your playing dynamics, and it has something to do with the clipping it just looks cool uh the kickstarter price was 179 and the retail price is going to be 300 so i'm like i bet i'll be able to sell this thing yeah worst case scenario i think if well, i don't like it i guess worst case scenario is the kickstarter uh completely like, fails well no the worst case scenario is the kickstarter succeeds and they just never actually produce the pedal yeah but they're an actual they're like a legit brand like they have other yeah. stuff on the market yeah like, like they have that big piano sustain style pe pedal that everyone fell in love with like two oh is that ago. them too yeah i was just thinking of they have it's the game is it the game changer plus i think it's called um maybe i'm completely wrong which but is, i assumed that's uh, who they were is uh i know i think both the guitar nerds and um blake from tone mob i think have both been talking about game changer um oh speaking of 
those guys. I listen to uh, yeah, they make the, the sustain thing. I listen to the the uh, guitar nerds quiz. Oh, you heard that? Yeah, <laughs> that, was I, a, that was a couple of weeks ago. Now I also got that question wrong because I think I went with um, twenty three point seven. Oh yeah, um, because so, because I think one of they I know they did something in a, a twenty three point seven, but I don't remember which guitar it was. So uh, one of the guitar nerds hit me up. And it was like, hey, we're going to do a quiz and we want to have some guests, uh, guest people ask questions. So come up with a question and record yourself asking it and then answering it and send it to me. And we'll put it on the show. So I got to be on the show. It was fun. I got to hear my own voice on someone else's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Blake Wyland was on there and the guy from Ormsby Guitars was on yeah, there. Yeah. Perry Ormsby. Perry from Gibson. <laughs> Perry. <laughs> Perry from Gibson. Is he from Gibson? I don't, no, that was just so when when they originally introduced you guys, like they introduced you as like, oh, it's Ryan from Sixty Cycle Hum. But then at the end of the episode, they're like, we want to thank all of our contributors again, like, and it was like Ryan from uh, some some California podcast, some California show, <laughs> uh, Blake from Canada or something, <laughs> and, and Perry from Gibson Guitars. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So yeah, going back to uh, that pedal, I'm stoked to get it when it comes in and do some demo work with it, like just have some fun making some video of a pedal that I own. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like the sort of thing that's right up my alley, like really gated, nasty, fuzzy, uh, distortion, overdrive sort of stuff. Uh, it's going to suck up a lot of milliamps. I think it's like like 300 milliamps or something Oh, wow. Like that. You're going to need like your own supply there. Yeah. I've been running into stuff lately that's got higher milliamps than I usually run on pedals. Well, it's because you got to generate that lightning. Yeah. But I've got the Ventress that runs on 300 and I think well, maybe 400. But that makes sense for the Ventress. Because it's a computer. But then I've got that, uh, that Tube Pilot from TC, which runs on 300 or something like that. Oh, oh right. So I had, that... to, I had to rewire my uh, the guts of my board the other day to accommodate those things. Right. Um, and I'll have another one that runs on 300 again. So I'm sucking up the milliamps. I you might have to get, get a better a, power you supply. Need to get a, some one of those Strymon supplies. I've been thinking I need to hustle and talk to a few different builders. Like, hey, does anyone want to uh, exchange a power supply for some ad time or something like right. that? Right. Just and then I'll you know do a video of it and be like, hey, I finally got a decent power supply because I've been running the cheap like Donner deal things. For yeah, a while and now. then what you do is uh, when you're doing like the off the cuff pedal stuff where you're using like your, your demo board, you put that power supply on top. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or I just make it part of like my demo table and it's just right. out or something like that. Right. Let's we'll figure, figure something out. I'm sure but then you need someone's two. writing you need one for your demo board and one for your, yeah, this is going to sound really snobby real... and like into myself, but I'm sure someone's writing me right now, offering us power supplies while they're, while they're listening to this. I don't. I I would be really surprised if that was happening. Really? Do you want to put money on it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bet on it. What? All right, we're, this is the episode where Steve and I fight again. <laughs> we're just gonna like battle it out and be angry at each other. All right. Uh, hey Ryan, this is a part where you ask me what's new. Hey Steve, what's new? I bought a pedal. You bought a pedal too? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's called. It's from Matthews we're, Effects. We're pedal pals. Yeah. Woo! Yeehaw! Uh, Why are we making weird noises? I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that reminded me of a very odd conversation I had today that is not appropriate for the show. Well, then don't tell it. Continue right. on with your um, story. So, anyways, Steve. it's a Matthews effects. It's called the Cthrimist. Um, it has, spell that for me. C H. Uh huh. Number three. Uh huh. M I S T. Sounds like it was written by someone who's leet. Well, it was written by Rick Matthews, and when it comes to building pedals, he is one of the leadest <laughs> around. Um, so uh, I found out about this pedal because I was added to the um, Matthews. It's called I think it's called Matthews Effects Innovators mm -hmm. group on Facebook. Now, are you um, supposed to be telling people that this group exists? Yeah, he's like promoing it on okay. Instagram and stuff. Okay, so there you go. I'm pretty as sure long it's as a it, thing. as long as it's not a secret. I don't think it's a secret. All right, man. I'll take so, your word in for fact, it. someone in the group was complaining. Well, that it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> I, I I know it was being promoted on like Instagram. Sure, on on his Instagram. So, uh, but basically, like this is the place where people who are fans of 
of Matthew's effects go. And I found out about this pedal because Rick was, or somebody asked like, Oh, could you do the chemist, which is the, his like modulation station type pedal. Uh huh. So, uh, the standard chemist is, um, chorus, chorus vibrato on it's like a, so it's a three channel effectively, or like a three effect single pedal. So one effect is coarse vibrato, depending on like how you have the knob set. One effect is octave and the third effect is phaser. Mm -hmm. So someone was asking like, well, are there any other like things you could like swap in and out there like to make, to do something else? And it was kind of bounced around. Like some people wanted like uh, it to like one of the effects to be tried out with reverb because of course, like Matthews is really like, has really, I think made a mark. With like the ambient, uh, with reverb, the ambient cosmonaut, reverb, the cosmonaut, the astronaut, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so that would be like another modulation option, or like some kind of delay. Um, but what they went with for the third option on the Cathremist is um, tremolo. That's cool. Yeah, so I'm I'm super excited about that because I don't. That's want... like a usable pack of uh, like a really usable pack of modulations. Yeah, to have on one pedal. Uh, I'm picking it up because I've got the subin up on my board right now, the subin up mini, but. Um, I've, I wanted the chemist for a while, actually specifically for the octave and for the other, other two things. And because let's be honest, like TC is not like the TC mini pedals aren't like something that get you likes on Instagram. Oh, damn, Steve. Um, so I gotta, that's get, harsh. Gotta get my board looking a little more, uh, a little more tone snobby. <laughs> Uh, so I <laughs> need some Matthews effects on there. Oh man, we've come uh, a long way in but, four years. But more, more realistically, like I, I wanted an octave, um, and I thought like to get an octave plus a couple other effects in a single size pedal was a pretty cool option. Especially like chorus is a thing that sometimes I think like, oh, I wish I had a chorus, but I don't ever want it frequently enough that I could want it all the time. Right, right. That I want an entire pedal slot dedicated to it. So this is kind of like the a win win situation until I want octave and chorus at the same time and then I'm in trouble. Yeah, I don't think I'd I ever use octave with other modulations though. Maybe with tremolo. I use octave with um well, I guess these are all time based, but I use octave with delay. Sure. Uh what I've been really getting a kick out of is using octave with octave. Octave with octave? Um it's not exactly Doesn't that. Doesn't that just but... put you back to normal? <laughs> If I was using octave down with only octave up, that I think would be... I watched a video of someone doing that, <laughs> doing an octave up pedal and doing an octave down pedal. Now I want to try. And that. It, this it, this gave you kind of like a detuned like chorusy sort of sound because it's just like double processing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to make a video of that when when I get this pedal in. Um, Do it. But no, what what I've been doing is I've been running the the sub up mini into the Golden Summer Reverb, which is the shimmer setting. Right. So it's a, the octave of the oh, octave pedal gotcha, yeah. plus the octave from the shimmer verb. Um, but anyway, I'm super, super excited about that. It's the first pedal I bought in a while. So um, that's going to be cool. Um, and that's all the new things I got. That's the new stuff. We're going to wrap up what's new. It's and the, the rest of the episode. Thanks, guys, for listening. On our show oh, yeah. where we talk about what's new. What are you doing? Ryan and Steve talk about what's new in their life. Now the segment is over. Let's talk about an ad. You sang well, last episode. It's my turn. This ad was sent by uh, Damian Michael. And speaking of singing, these are some... Bowls? Chakra-tuned quartz crystal singing bowls. Nothing like that. Uh, these sacred sound healing instruments have healed hundreds of souls and have had countless hours of Reiki energy and positive Who intentions. Is it Reiki? Is it Reiki? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Get it right, Steve. Into, the, into and through them. They are extremely powerful. They're great for meditation, music, healing, and are very beautiful. I have an 8-inch A third eye bowl, a 9-inch G throat bowl, a 10-inch F heart bowl, a 12-inch C root bowl, a 14-inch B crown bowl, a 16-inch D sacral bowl, and a cracked 11-inch E solar plexus. I discounted the price of their crack bowl. It's free with the purchase of a, the set of good ones. I'm only asking 800 for the set. These sets go for 1500 plus. I don't even know what these are. They're, you ever go to like the, the 
the kids science center and there's the the bowl with the handles on the side and you put some water on it and you rub it and like the water jumps around inside no oh no oh. <laughs> well i don't think that's what these do exactly i don't think you put water in them but it's like you you rub the outside of the bowl with a, like a marble rod or whatever he's using there. Uh -huh. And it causes the bowl to resonate at a pitch. And so it's like you can just sit there and make the bowl sustain one note as long as you keep rubbing the outside of it. And so you can play these kind of like they're, they're a musical instrument. And obviously they get used for, you know, this, you know, like a very hippie spiritual sort of meditation sort of stuff. Uh, this thing that's frustrating to me reading this ad, there's no, uh, there's no sharps or flats. There's only whole notes. Yeah, that's that's terrible. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, think like, oh, sharps and flats aren't real notes. Those are real notes, guys. I don't want six How are you bowls? supposed to play all of the songs that there are to play with only six notes? I mean, eight, no, there's eight bowls here. I need I need the other four. Well, I think the thing is, is like I think they're all like are they all intentionally tuned to like um Yeah, it says they're keys. No, I know. I know it, it says like specifically what notes they are, and they're all in the key of C, I guess. Um, no, they're, they're not. One's in A, one's in G, one's in F, one's in C, one's in B. But that's one's just a single. Don't they only produce the one note? Right. So I'm saying like you could play, let's see, you got an A, you got a C, you got a G, you got, you got a F. Oh, you need an E, and then you can you play can, Brain Stew. You can play, uh, uh, you can play that Violent Femme song. With these bowls, which the G, one that's had just blister GCD. in the sun, blister in the sun. Okay, yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can do with these. You can you can play. Oh, there's a, there is an E. It's just cracked. So you yeah, could, you could totally play. I'm, I'm worried about that cracked uh, E solar plexus bowl, the 11 incher. Uh, how hard is it going to be to replace that? Like, can I? Is it going to match the set if I get a replacement? Like, is it going to have the same uh, kind of reeky energy? as the other bowls or is, what's reiki energy is my whole like bowl situation going to be imbalanced if i replace that bowl That's if you really since these are and all what shocks. caused that e to crack that doesn't sound like these are very well balanced with reiki energy i just want to know um since they're chakra tuned do you have to play them in a specific order or if you open your chakras out of order like what happens i don't know man I just know that these would be used for evil in my hands because I'm so into dissonance that I would find a way to make these, they're all, they're these all, bowls sound bad together. They're all just notes. They're all just a scale. I know. What I do is I'd, modify, I'd try to fix that E and it would like shift it out of being an E bowl and then it would be my main bowl and I would combine the other bowls with it and just sound awful. And I'd be like, yeah, this is my aggravating bad sound that makes everyone angry your aggravating bad sound them so how's that different than their your normal no that's guitar? what i'm saying that's my normal guitar sound is oh, what okay. i go for but i you know just you know despite me teasing you know the kind of like a uh, like spiritual like a uh, self-healing side of these things i've always kind of been into like these friction based kind of like very basic instruments like you ever like rub your finger on the edge of a, a wine glass and make it sing I've done it a couple times, but it's usually, the same concept. Usually, anytime I've got a wine class, it's full I think of it's, wine, I think so. that sort of stuff is fun. Like I, there was one time when I was a teenager where I I got a bunch of glasses full of water and I tried to do that little uh, glass solo that's in that one Beastie Boys song. You know, it's it's fun to mess around with stuff like that. I don't know if the value of this is on point. I just thought it was you know I've seen singing, fun instruments. I've seen singing bowls on. Um, craigslist before but they're usually like not all like how this is all quartz so it's all they're all white right right um but these things are heavy but uh so i've only ever seen like mismatched multicolor ones you think they stack together you just put them all in each other and yeah. then carry it out um uh, i don't know maybe they look like they almost could Maybe that's how the, some of them. maybe that's how the E got cracked. It was just a little bit too tight in the uh, the C bowl, and they cracked it when they're trying to pull it out. I bet they don't fit. I bet there's uh, something really aggravating about them. They just almost fit, but they don't quite. So you can't stack them. And I bet that's 
like that just messes up this dude's whole day when yeah. he tries to move yeah. him around and stack him. Every time he plays it, he well, he lives. He in, gets so angry. I think that's a picture of the bulls in their home. So he's in a tent. He's in a little tent. Uh, it's hard to tell. There's something printed on that tent. I think it's mushrooms. Is it really? Yeah, I think so. All right, let's move on to... Oh, it definitely is mushrooms. Let's move on to the topic. Yeah, this topic was sent by Alan Chappell. He said, I'd still like to hear your thoughts on a library gear lending program. And have you guys built a collection for a theoretical library? So so is he the one whose local library has like gear in stock to check out? Yeah, so basically uh, he says they've got pedals and cheap amps and guitars that you can just check out for free. Um it's a cool concept to get people interested in gear with a zero dollar point of entry. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, like, you know, it's I pointed out that it's yeah. not free because, you know, we pay for this with our tax dollars. Sure, sure, but, sure. It's, uh, it's free for the people who need it to be free. Right. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it's a collective. Sure. We're all, you were all paying, you know, a, a dollar a year or whatever. If the, if the library really wanted to help out the community, they would have practice spaces built into the library so that these kids who are checking out big muffs aren't taking them home and blowing out the neighbor's windows. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I don't remember what, what all Alan has said before is in this library uh, available, but um, so I guess that would be kind of where we would jump in is like, what would you, what would you want to see? Like what? Well, I'm assuming that the, the purpose of this is for, uh, people using the library to receive a gear education sure so like the gear side of a musical instrument education where they can explore different kinds of gear and explore different kinds of instruments and figure out what they like and don't like yeah so that's definitely the angle you have to go towards it's not about like oh what's the best version of something it's like what is the most educational version of something right i wouldn't even i i agree with that and um, what I would say is um, I think that uh, part of part of picking that too is, and I guess maybe that's part of what you're saying is like, what's broad? So yeah, we can all, we, we can, everyone, anyone can argue like, what's the best tube screamer? Sure, sure. But if I was going to a library, right. I, I feel like even though it might not be like the quote best tube screamer on the market, like it would make sense for the library to only like to have, if they only have one to have a TS nine. Yeah. I was going to say like that there's cheap, you could think about it in like in budget ways and like, Oh, let's get like the best deal for the library. But honestly, if you're giving someone an education, I feel like going for an Ibanez, TS9, like an Ibanez branded tube screamer is the way to go to cement it in people's heads. Like this is a tube screamer. Yeah. And this is the brand. This is the source. This is the reference point for you to work off of where like, yeah, you could drop an East river drive in there from EHX and it would give them the same sound, but they might not like understand this is a tube screamer. You know, they might be like, man, I tried that East River Drive, but I keep hearing people about talk about tube screamers. Like, right. I still need to try a tube screamer. Yeah. Like there's there's the education side of it is that you need to expose people learning about these things to the source material. Is All right. So, so with like yeah. you get a big muff, get an EH, EHS big muff. Right. I was going to say, so, so what would you say is for just a what we do? guitar and bass what would you say are would be like your core uh say like six pedals sure two well, amps do we need to limit it because the way the library works is that you rent one out at a time so it's not like you need to put a put a board together you could have a lot of different right but i'm saying like out. but i'm saying like you know, for our purposes, we need to limit it. Like, yeah, the library can have whatever they want, but like, what would you, I would say like, you could have like a core, maybe not six isn't enough. I don't sure, know. Sure. Unless one of them is like the helix effects. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I mean like, yeah. I don't think there should be multi effects at all. I, I agree with what you're saying. Like, okay, you have, so you have like a tube screamer. Right. And then you have like a big muff. And then I don't know, you have, um, what would you have like? I would say like you should have some kind of delay, but what would you 
Well, well I, for have. the delay, I'm going to just come out and say I think they should have the Canyon by EHX because that is a delay education in a box. There's a lot to work with there. There's a lot of, well, maybe not though, because there's a lot of ways you can get yourself in trouble and not know how to get back. Right, right. So, mm. so I'm almost thinking like MXR Carbon Copy. Yeah. Or maybe the Carbon Copy Bright. Yeah, I, I like where you're going. Like get get a Carbon Copy and be like, here's an analog delay. Yeah, experience simple. an analog delay, and then on the other side of it, have like a DD7. Sure. For digital delay sounds. Um, I mean. I th- I think yeah I don't know I think maybe if you're thinking library like you gotta just you gotta just do you have to go with one I mean you don't want to go with one but no no you don't have to um, go with one I th- I think it's a good idea to cover like the basics like cover the the ground that every like beginner electric guitarist like goes on forums and asks right. about like what's the difference between an analog and digital delay like what do I need to know here. I think a rat would be a good pedal to have in there. Mm. Um, a fuzz face. I think uh, as far as fuzz goes, you need to have a fuzz face and you need to have a big muff. And that answers most people's questions. Yeah. Uh, and then we could just what do, would a, you do for like, a, the, do they could just do the Dunlop mini for the fuzz face. You know? Right. What would you do for some, say some kind of uh reverb? I'm thinking like a, maybe mm. a RV five, RV six. Yeah, that's yeah, probably a boss. Something, yeah, something simple. Um, I would think like, um, a you'd have if I mean, the the thing with effects is like overall, like every effect that we've named, I think is no more than one hundred and fifty dollars new. Sure. And so what gets tricky is like what what kind of budget do you provide on like if if you wanted to actually be able to provide instruments. Uh, what kind of budget do you put in place? Yeah. Is it similar? Because I think from a library side, like I guess if you had a setup, a person who could do setups, like you could go with like the Squire Bullet Mustang. Sure. But if you don't, aren't necessarily going to do that, I was thinking like maybe something at least Squire Standard Series. Yeah. But now you're poking at like towards the $300 mark. Um, I, th- I think like picking... Three electric guitars to cover the most ground as far as an education goes in electric guitars. I would go for like a classic vibe Telecaster. Mm -hmm. I'd go for some kind of like, I say super strat, but not with a Floyd. Like it could have a strat uh, bridge on it or it could have a hard bridge. And then uh, some variety of like a take on a Les Paul, like a right. double humbucker, single cut Les Paul sort of thing. I feel like that would cover the most ground as far as introducing people to the basic concepts of different guitars. Like yeah. You have a classic playing uh, and feeling kind of guitar with the telly. You have a more aggressive but still Fender-ish sort of thing going on with the Super Strat. And then you have a squarely like double humbucker classic sort of thing going on yeah. with a, with a Les Paul style guitar, which would probably be an Epiphone of some kind, or maybe even uh gee, I don't know. What would be a good alternative? Like a hammer, a cheap hammer. Yeah. Like a hammer, uh, one of the hammer summer XT. Yeah. Um, I was thinking like just the, yeah, like Epiphone Les Paul studio. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it does go back to the point of like, if you're going to have a tube screamer, have an Ibanez, like have a brand reference point. So people understand the education that they're getting. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, yeah, I think like, you know, you just mentioned Hamer, but like, I don't even, are they back in business? Again? They are. They are. They exist now. I think they're, uh, aren't they under Harmon now? I don't know. I forget what brand they're, they're um, underneath right on now. On the base side, I think I would say, uh, I mean, you're the, Kind of like obvious choice is obvious, but I think you got to go with uh, have a uh, a P bass, oh, of course, a jazz bass. And Do you feel is jazz bass really necessary? I, think I feel so. like jazz bass is is more niche. Really, but I'm not a bass player, so I think uh, I. I mean, you know, it always depends on what you're looking like, where you're looking, I guess. But I actually feel like I see more jazz basses. And then precision bases in, in use. Interesting. Um, but you know, it, it just I I guess it 
probably really depends on the scene. I, I get my first instinct, like I said, I'm not a bass player and I don't follow bass r- really at all. My first instinct would be a P bass and then some sort of like Ibanezzy thing with active pickups. Yeah, I would definitely say, um, well, and you could kind of go like two birds with one stone and get the like the Squire uh, Precision Deluxe, which is like 200, somewhere around there. Uh-huh. Um, and it's a PJ configuration. So you get the precision in the in the neck position, mm-hmm. or I think it's technically considered a middle position. Yeah, what about uh, and then a jazz in the in the bridge, and then I yeah I was thinking like an Ibanez uh, SR. I think it's the SR three hundred or SR five hundred, which uh, is going to give you like basically you're going to have like one classic style bass uh, and one that's like a modern more modern take on a bass. Right, right. And then of course an Epiphone viola. Of course, everyone yeah. needs that around. Yeah. Just, you know, just kick it around. Good. Literally, beetle kick bass. It, kick it around. <laughs> <laughs> now you might as well throw in one of those uh, D Armands with the rubber strings. You know, oh, geez. Just in case. Uh, what about amps? Like, what kind of amps should a library have in Boss stock? Katana. That's what I was going to say. And they should have like three or four of them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it should be like is there the, a base version of the plus i really wish there was uh but i think you can i for a student i right. bet you could just use a katana 100 and not worry about it for bass there's enough low end in those to hear what you're doing but i wouldn't use it like really in a band setting I right guess. right but yeah i the the katana is just the shoe in for like it might as well be like a rental gear scenario like you go to the beach and get a rental surfboard like yeah the katana is the rental surfboard of amps in a really good way like it's just going to cover a lot of ground for a lot of people so i think it makes sense i can't think of any other amps that would be good for a library situation because you don't want to have a two band getting kicked around by some yeah. t- a teenager who doesn't know what they're you doing need something it's that can like, get take messed up but isn't going to be like too and it's just know. it's re- unless you plug it into the computer, the controls are so straightforward you can't get yourself in trouble easily. Yeah. It's not like a big programming amp on its faceplate. It's got all the basic controls you need, and it's just really easy to deal with. And someone could preload, you know, necessary sounds into the couple banks that are on there. I think it's a, a good option. Um, is there anything else? No, I, I mean obviously it's... the library needs to be fully stocked with sinusoid cables. Yeah. Yeah, of course. The cable's so sexy, you're going to want to put it in your pants. Are you still trying to make that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to stop now. That's my new thing. Uh, next uh, ad? Yeah, this uh, ad was sent to us by The Inboxer. Um, and this is uh, an AudioVox Model 736 electric bass guitar. Excuse me, which was the world's first electric bass guitar ever manufactured this is an ad from ebay it says what we're placing on auction today is one of only three audiovox model 736 electric bass guitars known to exist uh one of the model 736 bases um is in the paul allen emp museum in seattle and the other one is held by a private collector of vintage guitars uh, these model 736 electric bass guitars were manufactured by my grandfather Paul Tutmark in Seattle, Washington, starting in 1936 under his AudioVox brand name. Um, the story of this vintage bass guitar model was recently told in vintage guitar magazines. Um, there's actually a YouTube demo of one, which I would, probably should check out. At some I watched point. it. Uh, this electric bass guitar has been owned for over 60 years by one owner and was purchased directly from my grandfather, Paul Tutmark. The guitar shows some minor signs of wear, but is in overall good condition. It plays fine with the original pickups. Uh, still work fine. The guitar is in all original component configuration. Of the three Model 736s known to exist, the one in uh, the one in the EM, EMP Museum is a painted model. The one held by the collector is finished, uh, is finished unpainted varnished wood, as this one is. The wood appears to be black walnut. Original guitar case is in good condition and it is included. Shipping costs to be determined by destination. So what do you think about this? This thing sold for $23,850.09 on that eBay. That is crazy. That's bananas. But it's the first electric base in the world. Yeah, and there's only three of them. And it's it's pretty wild to look at the source 
and like think about how far the design has, of base has come and how far it hasn't come. Like it's all there. Yeah. The concept is there. Um, and from what I've always understood, bass guitar really didn't exist for a long time. Like it was like right. a completely different instrument. And like the electric, the, the form it took as the electric bass is completely different from any other instrument that existed prior. Sure. Like it's its own thing. Um, and it's just really interesting to look at this and be like, it's got a somewhat modern appearing neck on it. Mm -hmm. A modern like sort of headstock thing going on. It looks good. It looks honestly like not to discount it. I mean, even the nut, like the nut isn't like a weird like dimension or anything like that. It looks like a modern nut. Yeah. The tuning pegs look small. They don't look modern, modern big tuning pegs, but they have like that base tuner shape to them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, things get a little weird with the shape of the body. It's kind of like a weird, like viola sort but of shape. But there's plenty of like weird, yeah, yeah, things out there. But so. it looks this looks playable as a electric bass in a modern sense. It's not like you know, like the Wright Brothers airplane was like the funkiest airplane you've ever seen in your life. This is yeah, this is a bass guitar, and it's got a you know, it's got a got a cable coming out, and it's in a bass guitar case, like. It's amazing how close the first electric bass guitar is to the modern concept. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, the bridge I, is really interesting. It's a really small little strip of something, and that kind of lends back to a um, more of a classical instrument. Yeah, sort it kind of it really reminds me of like a banjo bridge. Yeah. There's no visible pickup on this, so I'm assuming it's some sort of uh, uh, piezo, like microphone sort of pickup. That's what I was wondering too, because it says the, the pickup is like is there. But really like, cool, where? like hexagon knob on this thing. Oh, I, I think that knob is really nice. I, I think overall, like, I imagine they had to catch wind of this. Like, I want to see the uh, the Eastwood version. I know, right? Oh, did you notice that it's string through too? Yeah, yeah. The strength goes through the body. Really cool. Oh, yeah, totally. I'd love to see Eastwood tackle this. I think they would do a really fun job of this. The pit guard is rad. I can't tell if that's a like a celluloid moto or something like that, or yeah, if it's, it's like pretty crazy. A weird polished kind of brass. In the video, it looks, and in this shot, it looks metallic. Yeah, like it's some sort of like crystallized metal. Yeah, in other shots, it does look more uh, like of a like, like you a, said, like a moto. Yeah. It's just a trip. Uh, so often we see things sell for ridiculous high dollar values because someone famous played it. Yeah. I always get more of a kick out of this sort of thing where it's like, oh, this is just a really old guitar and it's the first of its kind and it has like a history behind it beyond like who played it. Like who cares who played this thing? It's it's an instrument of value for its own sake. Yeah, not because someone famous played it, and I think that's something that it's actually really tickles. One my of the fancy. things you're talking about the tuners. One of the things that's interesting about the tuners is that they're uh, all the same. Like those are actually yeah. like four on a side tuners. Yeah, they're not. Uh, they're not supposed to be like totally. There. They probably pulled them off of some other instrument. Yeah, because yeah, the gears in a, in a different place on the other side is they are turned around. Yep. I wonder how I in the video the guy fiddles around with it and plays mm-hmm. it a little bit and it's like okay this guy's kind of playing it but it's not like he's not ripping into it. I'd love to see someone who plays bass in a really modern way uh have some fun with this thing. And and he was using like a little uh bass amp. I'd love to hear it through a modern rig too. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to know what's going on with the electronics. What are the pickups like? What's underneath there? The uh, the guy in the video made a point that he was messing with the uh, the volume knob on it, and there was no crackle on the volume knob after what eighty years. Mm-hmm. Like it's still nice and smooth and quiet. Right. This is a, this is a cool ad. I'm glad Adam found this. Yeah, this one's, uh, this one's a good one. Yeah, and I'm glad it was like all the info was still up on eBay, even though it ended. That's even the one in, thing I like about eBay is that yeah. stuff stays up. Um, so, like you, so you can actually kind of like get like actual representations of the way people who have sold things were also like how they advertise them. I really love the 
the logo on the headstock. It's like a metal badge. It's right. so funky looking. I can't even describe it. Go look at the pictures of this thing. Look up the video of it. It's in pretty decent condition, too, for being so old. Uh, do we want to tackle the next topic? Yeah, uh, this is a two-parter. Uh, the first part, this was from Christian uh, Avila in the Facebook group. He says, beer, where's the sweet spot between loosens you up good and I'm dropping my pick every 10 seconds? <laughs> well, you you probably haven't played a bar show in a long time, Steve. So- Even when we played bar shows, I've never I never drank before shows. Right. That's kind of my rule generally. It depends on when I'm playing. I I definitely drink to time it so that I'm not going to be buzzy on stage. Right. Like it's okay to feel a little loose. Like you feel a little loose in your shoulders and be like, ah, you know, I'm kind of just like relaxed now. But the moment you start getting a well, the moment I can't speak for anyone else, the moment I start getting a buzz, it's like this is going to cut into how well I play. Right. So you're not going to find me just throwing back drinks before my set. I'm even iffy about like drinking while I'm on stage. Like if people bring me drinks, mm. I'm like, I don't want to like, you know, drink this shot or whatever and not be able to complete the set the way I want to. But then as soon as I'm off that stage, assuming I have some time to sober up afterwards, I'm like, uh, now's my time to drink. Right. Uh, you know, get the wet stuff in me right now. The wet stuff. And then I've got, you know, time while the other bands play to, uh, to sober up. Yeah, I think um I think it it kind of just depends on what you what you need and whether or not you actually need it. Like Sure. Um I've talked to people um who I've never known I've never known anyone to actually do it, but I've heard lots of people who are like oh, if I like I I wish I could like take a shot of whiskey before going up on stage. Like a stage fright thing? Yeah, just oh, okay. as like that kind of thing where it's like because that's all what loosening up is, is like, so you're just like flowing and not, sure, you know, sure. um, I'm t- well, I, when I say loosening up, it's not cause I have stage fright. It's like, you know, get like, like make my body feel a little looser, you know, like, right. Let my shoulders down a little bit. I, I don't have any stage fright issues like at all. It's almost a little sick, <laughs> but, um, I just feel I, like I get that. Like if someone if someone does need to like calm their nerves, I get that. Right. So I guess I kind of like interpret it more that way. Like, and for some people, I think it's even like a subconscious effect where like you could give them, you know, a pint of O'Doul's. Sure. And they were like, "All right, I'm I'm good to go now. Like I'm pumped. I got my beer in me." I mean, like, if they don't notice that you just gave them really awful tasting sure, beer, sure. sure. <laughs> But I get what you're saying. Like, it, there's a psychological effect to it. Like, okay, I've I've had my thing. I've had my spinach. Now I can fight. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um. So other than that, like, uh, where's the sweet spot? It's going to depend between each person, and, and and with everything, I I've always heard like, uh, that it really just comes down to. It's it's all it's actually all psychological. Like nobody actually performs. I thought you were gonna say no one actually gets drunk with all in yeah, their head. Yeah, no, nobody actually performs better like drinking than they would. Sure, sober, given like whatever mental blocks are in their way. Unless what? you're bowling, you need a couple of drinks and you need to bowl well. <laughs> even bowling right i know i'm just joking i uh, know some things joke. are definitely like way more enjoyable like i think yeah i think bowling is on that list of things that are like more enjoyable a drink or two in than I, they are because otherwise you're just like i think when you're bowling like sometimes it's easy to get like too focused on the game and not the environment and i think you know Let's like, not talk about bowling anymore. <laughs> you brought up bowling. Man. I know, but I just want to do it as a joke. I are didn't want to other, go down a other, bowling uh, subtopic. Are there any other sports you do you like to drink while participating in? Pool? Dude, I'm bad at I don't I don't pool. Okay. Like what about, you hate swimming? What about swimming in the pool? <laughs> <laughs> I I've drank while near a pool and in a pool. Mm-hmm. I've drank in a pool. Uh <laughs> man. Don't drink the water in the pool. It's got nope. urine in it. Nope. Uh, what would be another good sport to drink while you're? Um, oh, I've it? I've uh, I've drank while playing kickball, adult kickball. Uh, if you like like uh, 
croquet. Is that how the way you say it? I feel like if you're pl- drinking while playing croquet, you can only drink cocktails. Mm. No, be- like no beers, only cocktails. Yeah. Uh, or like just like fine scotch, neat. Mm, mm. Uh, or like champagne. I think like champ- mimosas. You know, all wine. Mimosas. mimosas. Yeah. Croquet on a Sunday morning. Yeah, I'm liking, I'm liking this subtopic. Sunday, Where morning, this? Sunday morning brunch croquet. What's like the most extreme sport you could do and perform it while drinking? Like the most like physically demanding sport. Well, have you, are you familiar with the beer mile? It's like a running thing, right? Yeah. So, so it's four, four laps, four beers. Uh huh. But like, so you do, I think it's uh lap beer, lap beer. So you, you run a lap, then you drink a beer uh-huh. and you have to drink it within a, a zone. Someone was telling me because I I was part of a conversation. Was, was there's also was talking, on, there's also along that line there's vodka steeplechase. Right, right. Where is like these different races or like relays where you got to you know, drink a lot when you get to certain yeah. spots. Someone was telling me in in San Francisco they have the the Franzia quarter K. <laughs> you run a quarter of a kilometer and then you drink a box of wine. <laughs> Sounds like a good way to die. To yeah, uh, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you sure it's only a quarter? K? Uh, it was something ridiculous like that. Because that's hell. That's like super short. It's super short. <laughs> you just you sprint and then you drink a box of. That's wine. like that's like. Oh, geez. Was, like, going back to playing music, <laughs> like. Do you feel like there's a genre of music where you could like sit back country and like drink and be fine? And okay, so you're saying country. I say country and I don't even mean that in like a stereotypical bro sort of way. Sure, sure. I think like I think this is playing guitar or bass. Uh I'm thinking like frontman status. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm th- also thinking like you're thinking acoustic. I'm unplugged. saying like if you're doing like you walking around. I'm saying if you're doing like Johnny Cash covers. Sure, sure. And you're you know sh- you're like you got your uh, you got your Jack Daniels on the rocks that you're hitting up like, but it's never empty. This is a dangerous thing to make part of your gimmick. To be the drunk performer, because now you got to do that every time you play. I'm not saying you have to like be the drunk performer. I'm just saying like this is like part of like you, you can you, you can regulate make, it. You can make it happen. Yeah, I'm saying like I think there's a certain like ambiance to it, right? And the music is generally like you know GCD with a couple minor chords here and there. And I think if you if you you know let everything kind of like balance out. Um, and you, you know, you play it cool. Uh, it could, it you could, it you, it'll, you know, help you unlock those demons that you really need to like, to like, make the people feel the music. Sure. Kind of like in the same way, like, you know, the classic jazz or blues like lounge uh, show. You're, you know, the guitar player is going to be sitting there, smoking a cigarette, uh, with a with a glass of with a glass of something. Yeah, you sure. Know? And it's, it's a very classic jazz, look. jazz cigarette to go with it. A jazz cigarette and a martini. Yeah, yeah. And a piano. I feel like if I was playing the right kind of jazz, then I could sit there and you know have a nice scotch throughout the set, like work on a work on a drink as I'm going. But like, then you like, know, I sir- guess the question is like, are you actually drinking enough that you know you're doing anything that anything beyond this is this is a nice drink. Right, right. I feel like if I, if I was in like a blues jam band, I could sit there and just, you know, pound beers and be okay. Yeah. Um, surf rock is tough. I can't drink and do Dinosaur Ghost. Right. Because it's like I'm dealing with 16th notes here and I got to hit every single one. Right. Like this got to be really fast and tight and it just, there's no room to be inebriated at all with that. I mean, when it once it's done, I'm going to enjoy myself, and I'm going to use those uh, those bar tickets that I have. But yeah, do we have anything else to say about this? No, We've been talking uh, about boozing. This the, is returned off like a certain uh, portion of our audience with no. this one. I'm sure. 
Um, Sorry, guys. What's funny is like we, we, after a super sloshy winter, like I don't think we either of us have drank on the show in like a month and a half or something. Yeah, our our last like most recent iTunes reviews are all about Steve's drinking <laughs> around Christmas and New Year's. We really uh, got pretty loose with our uh, our holiday time. Um, so anyway, uh, go give us some fresh iTunes reviews, guys. Yeah. Bump those ones down a few slots. Um, the second part of Christian's question was, do you guys ever get mad at each other and then have to power through two hours of recording and keep your feelings bottled up inside of you? Uh, my first thought that on this question is... question is just right off the bat is just ridiculous. My it first takes us is, way longer yeah, than two hours. Two hours. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been here almost four hours. <laughs> We're not even done. <laughs> uh... I guess we weren't recording the whole time. No, like we well, were we always end up eating, and then we spend time planning the episodes and whatnot. You know? Well, the planning of the episodes are recorded. That, that sure, counts. sure, sure. Um, no, I don't know. I feel like we know each other well enough at this point that it's been a really long time since. I I guess I can only speak for me that I've been mad at you, Steve, because I we're both very like kind of like even keel you know what to expect from either of us kind of guys. Yeah. We're like, I think if there was something that you were going to do that would have made me mad in the past, I just expect it to happen now. So I'm like, oh, that's Steve being Steve. Nope, there he goes. There, he's doing his Steve thing. Everyone there sit back goes. and watch, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm assuming it's kind of the same for you. Like, I don't, yeah. there's nothing I'm going to do that's going to surprise you at this point, right? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, pretty much. And I'm sure there's stuff I've done in the past that pissed you off, but... I mean, is there any more of that that's going to surprise you in any way? Like, no, I just can't think of anything. Besides us doing something that would, like, interrupt the pro- productivity right. of I don't, what we're doing I don't here. Think there's ever been anything where it's like, I've been like, mm, this whole episode, I'm just going to, like, stab at this stupid thing that's <laughs> bothering me. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. I mean, even, like, rewinding a couple of minutes, we were talking about the episodes where... We get a bit inebriated and people complain about it. It's kind of like this kind of low consequence. I'm not really in the place in my life where I care enough to get angry about that sort of thing. Like right. If, if you got like too drunk to do a good podcast when I, I'd be like, well, whatever. Who cares? Yeah. It's also, it's actually kind of funny because uh, that set of reviews was actually really interesting because I think of like a couple months prior to that, we were getting like comments in, in other places like you guys don't drink. Like, why aren't you guys drinking anymore? But we were, we just were keeping it under wraps. And one of the reviews, one of the reviews was like, Oh, this show was really good until they like started like dr- talking about drinking all the time. And like, literally I think basically we started drinking in episode one. Oh, uh, we had it as part of our whole thing. Like, Oh, let's crack open a different craft yeah. beer every week. And I, eventually, I will say that, that eventually I got into Coors and that stopped. Yeah. That was actually a thing. Uh, I was thinking about this past week is no one has sent us, uh, any beer in a long time. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, it's been a while. Yeah. So, uh, I, in fact, I think the last, last time we got stuff sent to us might've been either, uh, some stuff sent from Connecticut mm. or, I think we had some stuff sent from Maine, but it was sent to me, so I think I just drank it all. Yeah. Because I was like, hey, Ryan, we got some like IPAs from Maine, and you were like, oh, I don't like IPAs, so just drink them. I was like, okay, cool. I don't remember. Yeah. We'll, I'll drink beer if you send it, guys. Yep. All right. Uh, let's hit up this thing real quick, and this thing is sinusoid.com. Sinusoid Pro Audio Couture. Like we said at the top of the show, go check out their website check out the build your own cable yeah and if you can't find what you want there uh, for an example of like something i know that they've done but it's like a one-off um is if you use in-ear monitors Mm -hmm. uh, they can they can it's tricky talk to them and see if they're still doing it anymore but i know in the past that they have taken a like a quarter inch cable and an eighth inch cable and wrapped both of those in the same tech. Oh, you're talking about the in ear snake for the in ear snake. My, uh, my worship leader got one from them from them. To yeah. Do that. So, uh, so I basically don't know. Do they, pro- do they make those off the shelf now? Or is that still a custom order? It's, I think it's some, I don't know if it's something they offer on their website, but they, they have a name for it and they can make it for you. Basically his, uh, his monitor feed comes off of his board because he has this fancy, uh, uh, uh who may 
makes it like TC Electronic, uh, sort of like vocal processor for. Oh, board. okay, right. Uh, so he runs, he, he he runs his ear monitor mix off of this board on the floor, and his guitar is plugged into the board as well. So it's like a, a double cable that's got a uh, an eighth inch jack mm. for your uh, for your headphone uh, jacks, and it's got a quarter inch jack for his guitar. It's a little snake that goes up to uh, his acoustic guitar and his headphones. It's pretty cool. So it's funny. This is a total aside. All right. Oh, anyway. Th- yeah. So thanks again, Sinusoid. Yeah. Uh, go check him out. Um, this is a total aside, but I was watching a video the other day and it said, um, the guy was like, said, uh, b- building cables and making snakes. And I looked at it and I forgot about the fact that when you take like multiple cables and you wrap them all together, right. like that it's, it's called a snake. It's called a snake. Right. And I just like, and I didn't watch the, I didn't like really watch the video cause it just popped up on my feed and like, and I just saw the title. I'm like, I'm, I'm busy, whatever. I don't watch live videos a lot anyway. Um, but I just kept thinking like, is this guy like j- jumping on our riff here? <laughs> like, cause like I didn't realize until I saw it later, I saw like, a different screen grab sure, sure. out of the video that he was making like a cable. Well, here's snake. the here's the thing to consider is because of our our snake branding, our snake marketing we've done with Sinusoid. Anyone who's heard us say that sort of stuff, that Sinusoid will make you think there's a snake behind you. Uh, every time they hear the word snake used in a musical context, now when someone's talking about a, a snake cable, they're going to think about Sinusoid. That's just good branding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this last ad was sent in by Ryan Stockhoff. It's an exotic wood custom. The way electric. you said that made it sound like you were calling him a name. Ryan Stockhoff. Stockhoff. That's, that's his last that's name. name. Stockhoff. But you said it in a weird way. It was a weird emphasis. It's just Ryan the way Stockhoff. My, it's just the way my voice sounds. I know. All right. This is an exotic wood. Custom electric Les Paul guitar. It's three hundred and seventy-five dollars in Birmingham Al. Uh, custom handmade Les Paul style electric guitar made with beautiful woods, including purple heart, spalted maple, cherry, and walnut. Guitar is made by a local Alabama Luther. Why did I say Luther? I don't know. It's because I was trying to put it's a, pronounced Luthier. It's because I was trying to put like a Southern accent on it. And it <laughs> Luther <just> failed. <laughs> uh, it sounds amazing. Trade for motorcycles, livestock, anything with a motor that runs, or just let me know what you've got. If it's got a motor that runs, or it just runs, <laughs> you'll take it. Uh, what if it's got a motor that walks, I know, right? Uh, what do you think? What are your first impressions of this? It is really pretty. I mean, for three seventy five, it's not bad looking. Uh, would... When you get up close to it in the close up shots, it is definitely like a homemade sort of look, where you can kind of see the orange peel in the in the finish. Right. Look at the uh, the neck joint meeting with the body. You can yeah, see that, that. I really that neck plate coming through. That I really don't like. That's pretty sketch. Um, yeah, it has a homemade sort of thing going on. The pickups are sticking out farther than any pickup I've ever seen. Like, especially that neck pickup, like with a Gibson style yeah. guitar, usually like the neck is angled so that the bridge pickup is really high off the bar, high off the body. Mm-hmm. The neck doesn't have an angle here. It's flat ac- across the body, but it's really high. I think that's... And so the neck pickup is almost all the way out. Yeah, of I think that ring. might be like just a consequence of the way the neck itself, like one, it's not really... It's not angled. It doesn't seem like saying. it's angled at all, but also I think if it wasn't a bolt on, it sure. would have been set like deeper into the body. Sure, sure. I do like... I do like the... Some of the other touches, the knobs are really cool looking. Like I think they fit... Yeah, cool knobs. Uh, they fit the thing there. And um, overall... I don't know if this is like three seventy five fun, but it may be like two twenty five. Mm, I, I'd have, I don't know. I, I'm having trouble imagining a scenario where I look at this guitar and I'm like, yeah, I need that. Well, sure. I'm just saying, I mean, like, at this two, is two twenty five. It might be like, huh, that looks cool. I want to check it out and see if it, see if I really like like it. I feel like if I saw this at like the swap meet, uh huh. I would be a hundred dollars curious. All right. Um, the whole like, like stacked strips of wood thing is a trend that I'm glad is kind of over for the most part. Right. I think this was a neat 
like application of it because it's kind of carved out and has like this interesting soft edge where the strips of wood kind of like wrap around on on the top Mm -hmm. humps there but the whole like like the moment you put a strip of purple heart in something i'm like okay i remember this whole fad right right like just the strips of different kind of exotic woods and you know it looks pretty it has an interesting look but everyone was doing this when i was learning to play guitar yeah and like every like going on Harmony Central, like every like custom guitar being made or like garage guitar being built by someone's like, I'm just stacking all these different kinds of pretty woods and gluing them all together in strips. And look at look at my strips. What are your strips look like? It was just this fad. And I'm I want to build a so guitar like over. that. But it's all just different types of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> when you see here, the, right here, this is a vertical strip of a three-eighths inch birch ply. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of like, it was this weird like pissing competition to see who could fit the most fancy woods into one guitar right. without like it being part of the tonality of the wood. Because it's like there's no rhyme or reason for this, the strips in this. It's not like, oh, this strip down here connects with the bridge in this way. Uh, and that kind of wood like gives you this response. And then the, and the wood that the other side of the bridge is connected in gives you a different kind of response. Like that, okay. There's none of that going on. It was all just like, what's a pretty wood? Let's, yeah. let's glue yeah. five pretty woods together. It was all kind of just done to create pa- like uh, usually like a symmetrical pattern. Right, right. Well, this is asymmetrical, which is interesting. Yeah. It's a, it is an interesting sort of concept here. This, Maybe it's like all scraps. Like he had different scraps around. And I think the thickness issue where like the pickups stick out so far is because he wasn't using pieces of wood that were meant to be a guitar body. Mm. So he was using wood that was too thin. Oh, gotcha. Like, so the woods he used does don't accommodate this. Right. I also wonder where he got the neck from. Did he build the neck? I don't know. It's an off, this is an awful lot of work to build something like this and have it, by your own opinion, the seller's opinion, only be worth three seventy five. Yeah, and this is from a from a local luthier. Yeah. So who knows, like, what that even means? We should look up all the local guitar builders in Birmingham, Alabama. It could be just like the first guitar that some dude who's actually established now ever made. Yeah. You yeah. never know. Uh, do we have anything else to say? No, we don't. All right, let's wrap it up. Yeah, this uh, song was sent by uh, Ben Walker. Um, he's in a, a band called, I guess I guess it's a band, or it's his uh, project. I'm not 100% sure, trying to sort of figure that out. Uh, called The Rejectioneers. And this song is called Way Too Hard. All right, can't wait to hear it. Enjoy. Sure, he tried to miss his holes in the wall For moments like this You can't be your sister, that's okay I'll never ask you to I just want for you to be the reason I'm successful I've worked way too hard for this I can't escape it even when I step out that is dragging me down When I'm alone Yeah, I feel alone When I'm with friends I still feel alone Well, I've worked Way too hard For this You should know I never hated you For ripping me apart When you walked in my bedroom I only needed you To smile when I needed shouldn't walk away I know that it's easier but something made me stay I've got convictions you've got prescriptions it's easy to ignore it and pretend it's okay well I'm 
Sometimes I wonder if I should have walked away You should know I've never hated you For ripping me apart when you walked in my bedroom Fix you. 